Oh, all right. Are we on? It said it's being live streamed. Yep. Yep. All right, guys. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Sophia Towns, Program Coordinator for the Low Country Autism Foundation. Welcome to another um, Community Conversations Facebook Live. Um, today, we have a great topic and a very special guest, one of my old buddies from LAFF. Jesse Osick, he is an, a pediatric occupational uh, therapist at Beaufort Memorial Health Link for Children. And Jesse and I are going to discuss common sensory issues um, that we find in kids with autism. So please guys feel free to post any questions uh, that you may have for us in the comments section and we will do our best to get those answered for you. Um, so Jesse, I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And um, here we go. We're just so excited that you're joining us today. Hey guys. Um, yes. Yeah, so my name is Jesse. I'm an OT at Buford Memorial Hospital, um, Health Link for Children. And I've been an OT for about nine years. Um, and I got interested in sensory integration, um, specifically in OT school, because my mentor was one of the um, pioneers under Dr. Ayers. Um, who started the sensory integration theory. So ever since I, you know, first heard about sensory integration, it is just an overwhelming, but also very interesting area of practice. And um, I know if you, your children get um, OT, you're very familiar with the word sensory, sensory processing, sensory integration. Um, and you might pretend and nod your head to some of the things the OT is saying. Um, and that's acceptable because it is a very um, complicated topic, even as an OT who has been trying to study and learn it more and more. Um, it's a never ending life, lifelong lesson um, and topic. So um, I'll tell Sophia the purpose for me today, what I would like to get across is at least laying the foundation for a general understanding of sensory integration, some of the common terms. Um, maybe some just general rules of thumb, which tend to help most children. But then again, every child, if you've met one child with autism, you've met one child with autism. And that goes the same way with, if you've met one child with sensory processing difficulties, you've met one child um, with difficulties. And then to add another layer, a child or individual's sensory need changes. <laughs> could be week to week, day to day, or year to year as they age. So um, you can throw anything out there. It's probably something I've heard of, but also there's always room to be surprised. Um, so in general, sensory integration is a person's ability to take in sensations from the environment and to use them purposefully. Um, so for example, we have um, different sensations that we take in. We take in auditory, what we hear. We take in visual input, what we see. Um, we take in tactile input, which is what we feel on our skin. Um, then we have some hidden and more complicated systems. We have the vestibular system, which is a little um, organ about the size or if not smaller than our pinky nail that rests inside of our temporal location up here. Um, and that detects where we are in space, whether we're moving fast or slowing down, where our head position is. And then we have the proprioceptive system. Um, what that is, is information that we get from our joints and from our muscles primarily. So um, to give an example of proprioception, um, I'm closing my eyes and I'm lifting my arm up and I know then my arm is going up because my muscles are contracting, my joints are going together. So that's telling me my arm is going up. So it's really important to get the foundation of what these terms are, because then as OTs, we know how to um, target different difficulties. So for example, um, and a lot of it comes from watching your child. Um, and it's every session and just atta attacking um, some of these difficulties is a partnership between the OT, the child, 
and a caregiver. We should all be a team member because what I see in a 45 minute session might not be what the parent sees seven days a week. And when the child is able to verbalize what they're feeling, then that's the most um, important information we can get as an OT and a parent. So, you know, it, ideally we get information from all three um, parties. So um, what I mean by when you watch a child, so say your child um, is constantly jumping off the bed or crashing or being silly, you know, they have the, maybe they have the coordination, but they keep falling off of equipment and laughing. That might indicate that they are seeking proprioception or proprioceptive input, which is the crashing, the rough and tumble play, the muscle, they love to climb. Um, they, it's like that input, that hard input. Um, if you're a vestibular seeker, which is the movement part, um, these kids might be spinning in circles. They might be taking off nonstop with, you know, boundless energy. They, you can't swing them fast enough. Um, they love that kind of stuff. Um, and then we get deeper into the layers. So with sensory integration or sensory processing, um, you can be under-responsive or over-responsive. Um, so an under-responsive child might need um, more input to feel a certain way. So um, they might be exaggeratedly sluggish. It takes a lot for them to move. Um, they tend to be just kind of sedentary. Um, and then you might have a child that is oversensitive, uh, which you know another term is sensory seekers. So they need more uh, and a stronger input of all these different sensations, tactile, proprioception, vestibular, they need more of that to register in their brain. So those kids might be daredevils. You might think they have decreased safety awareness. They might be jumping off of the playground equipment with, and they might get hurt and not even register it. Um, so like, wow, they have a great high pain tolerance. Um, so it gets really muddy when you're looking at all these different things. And basically as an OT, we're gonna try to take that information from the parent and also what we see the child doing and try to just form a hypothesis. Every, every treatment session is like a uh, experiment. You know, here's what I see, they're crashing a lot. So let's build them an obstacle course where they are jumping from one thing to the, the other or then you get them inside of a pillow and you make a kid taco and you're pushing them and you're putting on the lettuce and squeezing them. Um, you're putting on different toppings. And most, if you're a proprioceptive kiddo and that is what you've been seeking, then you tend to be um, more organized after you get that input. Um, if you see a kid spinning, they might be a vestibular seeker. So, you wanna give them a lot of input that's gonna satisfy that specific sensory system. And if they get the right amount of that, ideally they become organized after that. So um, big picture, that's what we call a sensory diet. When we locate or identify these things that are working consistently for the kid, um, we wanna give them a diet of these experiences or movements or activities that give them the specific foods they need to feed their nervous system. Um, so just like if I happen to miss a meal, I am absolutely starving. You get the hunger pains. And then when that food comes, you take it down without even taking a bite. Um, that's how I kind of relate it to um, an individual's nervous system. If they are seeking movement and they are not getting it, they are going to explode when they have the opportunity to do it. And um, one way you can think about that is if, you know, think, think about yourself. If you're sitting at a desk too long, sitting in a class, um, a continuing education course, you know, and you just feel like you're about to explode. You've been sitting there for two hours, you're losing focus, you're not alert, you're, you know, your nervous system and your brain is not ready to learn anymore. We're shutting down but you take a little movement break, you go get a sip of water, it's bathroom break, that kind of thing. You come back, 
your posture is better, you're more alert because you were able to give your body what it needs. We understand that as adults most of the time. You know, we know I need a cold shower to wake me up. I want a heavy blanket or pillows on top of me while I watch TV. It comforts me. I've been inside too long. I need to walk, go walk the dog and you come back and now you feel renewed. But, you know, a lot of kiddos or individuals and especially those with autism might not be able to articulate that, especially if they have decreased language skills. So it is important to watch for those signs so that we can see, okay, maybe they're seeking this or maybe they need some more of this. And then we build them a diet to give them scheduled activity breaks throughout the day based off of what they tend to seek out or need um, so that they never get to that point of hunger strike. Like I'm going to go crazy if I do not get it. We hopefully give them the foods they need or the meals, sensory meals they need throughout the day to stay satisfied, alert, ready to learn and organized. Um, usually when they're not getting the input that they want or need, um, that's when you see the behavior. And the behavior is just an end product. It's not always a purposeful thing. They're not trying to be bad or not listen or go crazy. You know, their bodies and nervous system are desiring something so bad that they have not gotten through the day. So big picture, that's what we're trying to do in OT is identify what they're seeking or what they need more of. You know, some kids, if they're avoiders, you know, they don't like getting their hands messy. They don't like being um, on swings. They feel insecure. Um, we need to slowly progress and slowly and progressively give them those experiences so that they can go play on the playground and not be scared. Um, they can play with their peers. Uh, they won't try to sit against the wall outside and not get the socialization skills or not experience the fun that you get with playing on a playground. Um, if we can address the issue of them being overly sensitive to touch or to like glue, um, we can slowly grade activities to where we make them more responsive and more organized and be able to participate in craft time or at the water play table or um, to be able to tolerate clothing without having to have such a fight or flight response. Um, so that's a lot. That's certainly not everything, but I wanna see if there's anything that I've said thus far that um, Sophia or anyone else might have a question on. I don't think so. I think um, if we could go back to, is the child under responsive or over responsive? So if they're under responsive, the input that that child needs is gonna be lighter, right? If they're, if, if they're over, wait, I'm sorry, here we go. This, this is where it gets tricky. Uh-oh. <laughs> if, if you're under responsive, that means you need more of a certain input to feel satisfied. Um, if you're over responsive, that is the fight or flight. So I have an over responsive, we think of like a baseline as like, I can tolerate clothing, that's a normal response. I have, if I'm over responsive to tactile input, this tag, I cannot um, cancel it out and move on. Right. Um, my, skin, my skin is not accommodating to it. So okay. I'm over responsive to that. If my feet leave the ground to step off of a curb and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to grab onto something. I feel like I'm falling off the edge of the earth. That is an uber responsive response. Um, so that's usually what we see. We usually see the over-responsive or under-responsive or the sensory seekers or the sensory avoiders. That's what's the easiest thing to see. Like, I know my child hates having his hair cut or his head tipped back. Um, and that's a tactile over-responsive and a vestibular over-responsive. So, you know, we look at what is disruptive throughout the day. You know, what is getting in the way of the child just being able to go through his daily routine? Um, 
appropriately without, you know, being distressed or without having such a negative experience. Um, mm -hmm. And when we identify those pockets, then we kind of dig deeper of what are they seeking and what can we give the parent to do to try um, for their sensory diet so that they don't reach that point of being over or under responsive where it disrupts their day. Wow. You're the man. Wow. Um, I do have, <laughs> well, I do have a question for uh, one of our viewers. Uh, what if the needs, uh, the sensory needs are constantly changing? Um, yes. What if, if there is a, a constant change with their sensory needs? How do you stay on top of that? How do you address that? Right. Um, it's going to be an ongoing communication with the OT. Um, like I said, what works one day um, mm -hmm. might not necessarily work the next day for that same child. Um, there are general concepts like, and I always take it back to being an infant. Um, what is calming to infants? They like to be right. swaddled. So usually um, compression, squeezes, um, proprioception. So like that, you know, you see people do joint compressions or squeezes, that kind of thing. Generally, that is a calming thing. That proprioceptive input and deep pressure tends to, talk, to calm the whole nervous system, whether they are sensitive to movement or to touch or um, sensory seeking with oral, oral things and mouthing. It's just the great, the great calmer. Um, and then as far as um, another calming thing is we, you know, we tend to rock babies back and forth. It's not a spinning thing, but it's a, a gentle, rhythmic, predictable rock. So that plus the deep pressure tend to be calming. Um, mm -hmm. Stuff that is unpredictable tends to be alerting. So I'm spinning, you know, when you, we spin, we get, you know, come off a roller coaster or something spinning us the teacups we are ready to go. You know, it's alerting. It's unpredictable. Um, if a mosquito comes on my back, back of my neck, I am alert. I am on fight or flight high alert because I feel that. So mm -hmm. those things tend to be alerting. Um, mm -hmm. So really it's getting trends. Um, I think the best thing you can do as a parent is to try to identify, and you can even journal. It doesn't have to be very specific and very like, organized, but hey, I noticed he tends to get unorganized at like 12 p.m. He tends to just go crazy. He takes couch cushions off. He jumps off and I think, you know, he's crashing the walls, that kind of thing. We can document the type of activities and what time they're occurring and look for trends. And that's where we're gonna implement the sensory diet ideas. Um, and, you know, once we identify the foundational difficulty, what area of sensory problems or difficulties are having, then um, we can set up that diet. And usually you don't, your sensory need doesn't change completely. It's not gonna go from, I'm a vestibular seeker and now I'm a proprioceptive seeker. It's gonna be a little, you know, they might need a little bit more input or a different kind of input. So, you know, once we get that sensory diet in place, we can make the little tweaks based off of how they're responding. But I think, you know, yeah, keeping a diary of these are the activities or these are the actions I'm seeing or the behaviors I'm seeing and when they're occurring, that's gonna let us know, okay, he needs this movement at this time of the day, another kind of movement at 4 p.m. And then right before bed, we can do this little five minute routine to bring him down, to calm him, and then hopefully he falls asleep faster and sleeps longer. And that's a whole nother Facebook Live about nighttime routines. But in general, that's what we're looking at. And, you know, again, just think of your own sensory needs. We, we all do them without consciously realizing it. In the morning, we wake up uh, tired, exhausted. We need a certain water temperature to wake up. We need caffeine to wake up. And then we're going through the day um, we need our lunch time as a break. And then at night, we tend to do things to bring us down. We'll put on Netflix. We will, you know, take a warm shower. We get in our pajamas. It's a certain texture we like, you know, um, some of us 
do this all day long. We need movement. You know, we tap our feet. Um, I get annoyed. I annoy my coworkers all day because I'm always moving, but I don't do it as much when I'm treating because I'm constantly moving. So um, it's, I would say the big take home um, message would be to be more observant of exactly what you're seeing and to also realize that behaviors are usually the end product of something else. Um, kids are not always acting out just to act out. Sometimes they do. Sometimes it is purposeful behavior, but sometimes a child might push another child because they accidentally bumped into him and the kid is tactile defensive and he wasn't predicting that. He did not know that he was gonna be touched and he had that fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So that might not be his, that, that's not that his fault. You know, he doesn't know what his body needs. Um, and if a kid throws a tantrum, when you try to go to the playground, here, get on the swing, let's go play. And they're throwing an absolute tantrum, they might have gravitational insecurity or poor vestibular processing. And when they're on the swing and they don't feel supported, it might as well be an astronaut on outer space because they don't feel grounded. They don't have, I feel like I'm, I'm terrified. And that's mm -hmm. an over responsive, but legit feeling for them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's hard, it's easy to see the behavior and see um, the outburst, but to take the time to try to figure out why is this happening? I don't think that they're trying to be disruptive on purpose. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think um, just thinking about my own boys um, who uh, have autism, especially in the afternoon, I notice one, one of the boys in particular, all the couch cushions come off. And I just end up, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm yelling at him. I'm like, pick up my pillows, put them back on the couch. I just straighten the house, you know? And, but, you know, I need to be more observant. Like there's probably some, he could be just wanting to be naughty and getting attention, but he also could be looking for some form of uh, sensory. Mm -hmm. but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm gonna start keeping a journal. That's a good idea. <laughs> Um, we do have another question. Um, let's see. Would you see more aggressive behaviors in a child who is under responsive or over responsive? Oh, over responsive. Over, over responsive. Yeah, over responsive is pretty much you could think of it as I'm overreacting to something normal that okay. or not normal, but I'm overacting to an input that most people don't find offensive. So, okay. like I said, like. Um, I, some kid sneaks up to me while I'm in the lunch line and it's too close. And I was like, oh my gosh, and I push him away and knock him over. Yeah. That's a disruptive behavior. The kid gets in trouble, you know, and that's not their fault. They were in a fight or flight because they are tactile responsive. They felt like it was a thousand mosquitoes on their back or a little nudge might've felt like a, you know, a gorilla pushing them and they reacted appropriate to what they sensed. Mm -hmm. So that's important information. And it could be, you know, while OT works on decreasing that, we mm -hmm. can take a compensatory um, approach and realize it's happening in line, in the cafeteria line, and it's happening, you know, every, you know, every week when they're in the line, maybe we should pull them and let them be behind in the back of the line. That mm -hmm. way they can see everything that's happening and there's no surprises coming behind them. Yeah. Um, and that's, we look for those little pockets and that's where it would come in handy. You know, that Jacob is having disruptive behaviors. When is it happening? It's happening in the cafeteria and in the lunch line specifically, you know, so we can narrow it down and say, okay, I think I know what's happening. Let's try that hypothesis and see if it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really good. That's really insightful. Definitely. I wonder how many kiddos we can save you know, as far as being sent home from school or getting in trouble, just from that one example. And I mean, know? it's not, we're not, it's not like we're saints. Like no. I, you know, it's, we have to gut check ourselves all the time as OTs and as parents, because the reaction is to react to that behavior and to assume that, what, what, why are you doing this? Yeah. But you have to always try to, all right, I need to take it back. It's not their fault. We know yeah. that they, they have sensory issues, so um, yeah. it's hard. It's not going to be a hundred percent. You know, you're not going to be able to react appropriately, even most of the time. 
But if you do some of the times, maybe it'll become a habit of, okay, let's just dial it back. What did I see? What happened? What can yeah. I do? Yeah, yeah. This is great. And it is right at four o'clock now. Because I'm there. Can't believe already. Right? <laughs> it's already time for me to do another obstacle course with a kid. Oh, man. Um, so guys, Jesse literally has been talking to us in between patients. So unfortunately, we do have to cut it off right at four today. Um, but the awesome thing is um, we're going to have Jesse back and we're going to be able to dive into more specific topics. Um, for example, um, I don't know, pica, you know, eating things, mouthing things that are not appropriate, um, maybe nighttime, uh, bedtime routines, trying to wind our kiddos with autism down, prepare them for a good, a good night's rest. Um, please let us know what you want to hear um, because he is just a plethora of information. And so we will present uh, topics on, on what you guys want to see. So please let us know in the comments um, and uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Jesse, thank you, friends. We appreciate it. And you, know you need to skedaddle to your next little one. So thank you again. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. And All right, like guys. Sophia said, please put as many comments or questions below, and we will make sure that we categorize them, even either address them directly or um, find out that there's a big need for a certain topic, and we'll make sure that we address it in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, everyone.